only mode. During the Q&A session, you may press star 1 on your touch tone phone if you would like to ask a question. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to your host, Mr. Patrick Shepard, so you may begin. Great. Thank you, India. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Advanced Practitioner Series. My name is Patrick Shepard. And I'm Ryan Segrist. Uh, we're very excited to be with you today for the final distance learning broadcast of calendar year 2014. The last one. We're not doing any more this year? No, I think this is going to be the last one, Ryan. Um, but it has been a really busy year, and it's gone very quickly. Uh, we want to take a minute to thank everyone for their participation throughout the year. Uh, your continued registration and participation in these events uh, allows us to continue to do them. We've had a very productive year, Ryan. So about how many broadcasts are we up to since uh, March of 2014? Uh, I think that we're up to near, we're approaching 40. I think, yeah, this is either the 39th or the 40th, depending mm -hmm. on how you count those events. Uh, so it has been very productive. And we'd like to thank everyone who has joined us uh, for broadcasts during the calendar year. We're very much looking forward to bringing you even more high quality ethics training uh, twice a month in calendar year 2015. Just out of curiosity, how many hours of ethics training is that, Patrick? I, I think we're up well over 40 hours of ethics training on the Google Plus and YouTube accounts. So if, uh, if you have colleagues who are in need of ethics training, want to learn more about some of the topics we work with every day in our jobs as ethics counselors, um, you know, please send them there. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of good resources. That's right. And uh, one other thing that uh, I'd like to remind everyone of is, uh, you know, you can also find uh, more training and more support type products in the IEG's uh, store on the Max community. So uh, make sure that you go check that out. Uh, you'll find all kinds of good job aids, extra training, different kinds of training, slides for training. Uh, there's so there's so many good resources there that uh, you really should take advantage of. Them. We should also take a moment to thank everyone who's contributed to the store. Uh, so if you have things that you'd like to share with your colleagues, things that are working well in your programs, uh, please do share those with your colleagues because they can put those to use right now uh, by going to the store and checking those out. And just to clarify, when we say share those with your colleagues, we mean send them to the store, share them with the wider ethics community, your colleagues all over the place, rather than, you know, I could hand you a job aid and technically I've shared, yes. shared with my colleagues. Yeah, we'd like to share them as, as widely as possible yeah. uh, because, uh, you know, the, the good things that you guys are doing out there can be sh shared among us and make all of our programs better. We'd also like to thank everyone for their feedback in the past few months. You know, this is the first time that we've done this. Uh, you know, we've never run a broadcast uh, a video before March. So uh, we've learned a lot from you guys, and I hope that uh, you find the quality and of both the content and the production of these broadcasts has improved over the last year. Uh, we would like to acknowledge your role in that and you know, letting us know what's working and what's not working. That's right. The course evaluations, uh, we always... Uh, I know that there is a tendency for people to think, oh, well, they're not going to use the evaluation anyway. That is not true. All of the improvements in uh, not only our video and audio quality, but also in our processes and procedures and the kinds of things that we make available to you online are all directly as a result of your feedback. So thank you very much for that. And speaking of feedback, uh, at least one of you, we're going to be able to provide a direct and timely response to a piece of feedback you provided last month. Uh, someone requested more Lee Francis after That's right. the 205 presentation. And we're very pleased to, to be able to tell you that Lee Francis will be joining us uh, with Seth Jaffe, both from our Office of General Counsel and Legal Policy on the 8th of January, so the, the, the first third or the second Thursday in January. Right, for your regularly scheduled fundamental series broadcast. And they're going to be discussing uh, something that they discussed at the National Government Ethics Summit, which is related to official duties for purposes of 2635-807. Ooh, that is a tough one. That is a tough one. And that's, you know, it's an area that's uh, evolved since the, uh, the implementation of the standards. Mm -hmm. It's something if you deal with uh, these issues a lot or infrequently can really trip you up. It's, it's not, it's not, tremendously intuitive. So we're looking forward to bringing some clarification there. Uh, another piece of feedback that we are very pleased to be able to act upon, uh, your repeated requests for assistance with your annual employee training programs. In calendar year mm -hmm. 15, we're going to make it a big priority to help you improve ethics training at your agencies. Uh, we're going to be starting in January by uh, providing you a model training plan. We figure it's the beginning of the calendar year, time that uh, it's a time of the year that people are thinking about their training plans. Mm -hmm. I want to give you a model document that you can put to work right now in your programs. And then we're going to be following that up with a number of events. We're going to be creating some modules and sharing those with you. Uh, so giving you pieces of presentations and learning objects that you can take from us and put to work immediately. So we're very excited about that. That's right. We're going to be covering uh, a, a range of audiences, and uh, we, we will also not only will we be we be helping to put some of those out, but for particularly specialized audiences, we're going to be contacting you uh, for your assistance to help us build these things. Yeah. 
So um, so that should be a, that should be an excellent effort in uh, calendar year fifteen, and we're looking forward to working with you to make that a success. So. So we've done a lot of announcements. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, so today we're going to talk about an introduction to enterprise risk management. Uh, and this is something that we talked about a little bit at the National Government Ethics Summit. Um, this presentation is similar to a lunchtime presentation that we delivered there. But if you watch that and you wanted to learn some more, we've tried to include some references and materials uh, in this presentation that weren't in that presentation so that you have a, a, you know, a base on which to build as you learn more about enterprise risk management. And one of the things, besides being one of my favorite things to do training on, uh, enterprise risk management is uh, increasingly becoming incorporated into government processes and procedures. Uh, we're going to share with you an A11 circular in the process of uh, giving the presentation uh, where we're going to have to learn how to speak this language and how to apply these concepts to, in order for our agencies to accomplish their mission and, and be protected from uh, the risk of ethical failure. So this is this is uh, going to be more important as time goes on, and you'll have a heads up if you can already uh, be able to proactively apply these uh, risk management concepts and ideas. Yeah, we, we really want to put you in a position where uh, you're ahead of the curve in your agency uh, when it comes to implementing these kinds of practices uh, so that you can approach your management chain and those people that manage performance at your agencies and contribute meaningfully to the risk management profile uh, in your organization. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I don't think any of these ideas are tremendously complicated, but it's really important that we do them. That's right. Uh, so we want to provide a reminder that you, know, you should be thinking about risk in your organization. You should be using um, those assessments to drive your work um, and really thinking strategically about how we deploy resources. So we're going to give you some frameworks to do that. We're also going to refer to a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. In an hour, we can't introduce you to the, the entire canon that has been written on enterprise risk management. But we have, uh, we have aimed to provide you some resources. And those of you who registered through the MAC site, uh, the final slide in the slide deck contains links to a number of resources. Uh, we don't like to give homework at these things, but I think uh, particularly for this presentation, taking a few minutes to look over some of those might be very helpful to, to you. That's right. So shall we get into it? Yeah, let's 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 begin. So when we talk about enterprise risk management, uh, what is it that we mean? What are we talking about? And we'd like to start that conversation by discussing the role of an ethics program leader. Um, you know, ask ourselves what what is it that the leader of the ethics program in your agency, or you as the leader of the ethics program in your office or agency or component. Uh, what is your role? What is it that you're trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish for the organization? Do you have any thoughts on that, Ryan? Uh, I do. Um, oftentimes, you know, I've heard folks say that, uh, you know, their job is to protect the agency's employees. Okay. Um, to help make sure that, uh, you know, people aren't taking gifts or that sort of thing. Um, a very sort of narrow uh, description of what you know what an ethics program leader does and when I, I think that's that's a difficult part and I find that to be challenging myself uh, when, I'm, when I'm working in, in ethics mm -hmm. is that we spend a lot of time thinking about the compliance requirements we spend a lot of time thinking about the specific rules we spend a lot of time dealing with the specifics of the program you know interacting with employees working on financial disclosure review drafting ethics agreements drafting screening arrangements uh, writing gift opinions that sometimes uh, it can be difficult to find time to think strategically about what your program is doing to serve the needs of your organizations. That's right. It's difficult to zoom out, if you will, to see the entire forest when we're focusing on single trees within the forest, like you said, doing doing ethics agreements or doing financial disclosure or advice and counsel. You know, these are individual trees that we examine very, very closely. But the problem is, is that if uh, if we can't come out and think strategically about how the whole forest looks, uh, then we're, we're doing a disservice to our agency's mission. And when it's time to discuss with your agency leaders uh, what work is going to get done over the next year, uh, you know, which programs are going to receive uh, resources and, uh, you know, priority treatment, it's really necessary for us to be able to quickly and adequately uh, explain the value of the ethics program to the organization. Um, you know, it's important to comply with the ethics laws and regulations, but we don't comply with them for the sake of compliance. Uh, we comply with them because we believe that they make our organization stronger, that they protect our organizations from reputational uh, uh, harm, and that they make it easier uh, for our, our work to get done uh, in the public's interest. Uh, so we're really supporting the work of the agency in the ethics office 
And I think, you know, one of the things we really want to start with and emphasize is that as an ethics program leader, one of the things that you have to understand uh, is what, what, what are the priorities for the organization? What work does the organization want to see you get done? What work does the organization itself want to get done? And find uh, ways that the ethics program can support that and protect those operations. That's right. Oftentimes, uh, we, we have heard from agency leaders occasionally uh, describe their ethics programs as being hurdles. Uh, of being something that gets in the way of getting their mission done. And that's not the way, that, that's not the right way to look at it. The ethics program is there to support and ensure that the work is done with integrity. It's done in a way that uh, is, is beyond reproach in order to make sure that that mission gets accomplished more efficiently. Because if you can't do it right in the first place, then what, why are you doing it? Yeah, and I think, you know, what we want to emphasize today is uh, to think about the ethics program not as something you do in addition to the mission work of your agency, but something that's integral to the effective carrying out of, of your agency's mission. Right. And it's think, interlaced into the processes. And I think as ethics program leaders, if you begin to think of yourself in that role, and when you're talking to others in your organization, start from that perspective, uh, you'll get better understanding and it'll be easier for others in your organization to see the value of your programs. Uh, so, so the framework we're going to use to do this is called enterprise risk management. Elsewhere, it's called organizational risk management. Uh, these aren't tremendously complex concepts, but I think the big important part is to make time to do them, to, to conduct these exercises, to, to do this thinking and planning. We have a, uh, a quote up on the screen right now, and I'll give you guys just a minute to read that, and then uh, we can read it for the benefit of the folks on the phone. So for the benefit of people on the phone, uh, the, the slide says uh, enterprise risk management, or ERM, is a discipline that addresses the full spectrum of an organization's risks, including challenges and opportunities, and integrates them into an enterprise-wide, strategically aligned portfolio view. ERM contributes to improved decision making and supports the achievement of an organization's mission, goals, and objectives. So what we're asking, uh, what, what in enterprise risk management as a concept, as a, as a management tool, asks organizations to do is consider all of their disparate risks. Uh, and as ethics, uh, as ethics officials, we fit into that portfolio of risk, but we, uh, we do not control it. We're, we're not in, in charge of the entirety of it. So the kinds of risks your organizations might face are your financial risk. You might have safety risks. You might have facilities risks. Uh, you may have continuation of operations risks. Uh, you might have reputational risk. So we want you to think about how the ethics program and uh, reputational risk in particular fit into the risk portfolio of your agency mm -hmm. and help you to, to join that conversation and, uh, and, and, and articulate and advocate for uh, the, the thoughtful address of risk to your agency's reputation. And we're not the only ones who think this. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the OMB Circular A11. Uh, this is updated every year, and it's kind of the guide that OMB uh, promulgates each year to help agencies and to direct agencies in their management processes. And this is there's been some interesting developments in this uh, in this uh, circular. Uh, one of the things that uh, agencies are going to have to start doing is to appoint uh, a chief risk officer. That is one of the suggestions uh, in the A11 circular. Mm -hmm. uh, the A11 circular also suggests that uh, agencies consider implementing enterprise risk management principles. Uh, so your agencies may already be thinking about some of these concepts because they were introduced uh, in some cases for the first time in this year's A11 circular that was updated in July. And we would encourage you to take a few minutes to read at least the relevant sections of the, of the circular. We've linked to it on the final slide. And think about, given the, uh, the direction from OMB with respect to risk management, how your office and programs can support those efforts in your agency. And this may give you an opportunity to start that conversation in your agency. One of the thing that, things that's also interesting is uh, it does list some different uh, general kinds of risks. Uh, that the chief risk officer is going to have to account for, and one of them is specifically ethics risks. Uh, yeah, we, we asked, uh, the, we, we are, are very pleased to see in the circular, uh, circular that the uh, reputational risk agencies uh, should be managed alongside of those other kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. So we hope that this provides you an opportunity uh, to begin talking about these things, and also some confidence knowing that you know at least a few people in your organization are probably already thinking about them. Uh, so it may be worthwhile to, to seek out and join those conversations.
So we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the ethics office and who we're protecting in our organizations. That's right. Oftentimes, uh, we, we, we have seen many uh, ethics programs that, uh, you know, do very, very good, uh, good work at protecting themselves from reputational risk, uh, but otherwise don't engage widely with the rest of the agency. We, we just want you to, uh, sort of food for thought, to think mm -hmm. about, you know, when you're looking at your program's goals, are those goals for the ethics office or are those the organization's goals that the ethics office helps to implement? And we'd encourage you to uh, adopt a way of thinking uh, that starts with the mission of your agency uh, and thinks about ways that the, the ethics office uh, can better assist the, the agency in carrying out its mission in a way that preserves the integrity and reputation of the organization. And not to think so much about the compliance requirements as requirements that the ethics office alone must comply with. Those are requirements that, uh, that apply to the entire organization, mm -hmm. and the ethics office is charged with um, carrying those out. Um, but not for the benefit of the ethics office, for the benefit of the broader organization. So when you're, you're, you're thinking about your strategy for the coming year, uh, we'd like you to think about how your organization can, um, how your, your ethics office can protect your entire organization. How best can you deploy your resources to, to protect the reputation and the integrity of the processes and procedures and the mission of, of, your, of your agency? That's right. It, it, uh, just, to, just to emphasize uh, again, um, you know, we, we need to think strategically. We need to look at the entire organization, the whole forest, not just the individual trees that, that are within it, uh, because the the risk, uh, particularly reputational risk, is something that's going to apply to uh, the entire organization. That's right. Not just to not just to your PAS filers, not just to your certain groups of employees. It, it applies to your entire organization, and it part of uh, your role is to help mitigate that risk. And, and it also provides you a starting point for conversations with uh, your management team and leadership. Uh, if you can speak in, uh, speak uh, confidently about, uh, one, the mission of your organization, you understand the work that's going on, and also understand how the ethics office can support that work, uh, the, the, the quest for resources and the need for resources, uh, the question sort of turned around. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, what are the risks to, to these missionaries? What are the risks to these programs? And then the question is, how many resources are, you know, what, what level of resourcing do we require to effectively mitigate that to the point that uh, the organization is comfortable? Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to be a, a better, more productive conversation than saying, well, you know, OGE makes us do this thing each year, so we're going to need another FTE to help us accomplish that. Uh, if we can turn that question around and say we understand uh, that the organization wants to, you know, conduct this number of procurements or wants to, uh, you know, conduct this missionary or carry out these procedures or do this study, and we think to support that effectively from the ethics side, uh, we need to do the following activities, uh, and those are going to take resources. The, the resources are then uh, tied back to the mission of the agency, and you might have a, have a slightly easier argument there. Yeah. So how do we, we do get, this? Yeah, I, I think, let's get into some nuts and bolts. Yeah, I think this is a... Uh, you know, in, in theory, this is a, we all agree that this is a good idea. I think it's a very easy idea to agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty comes, what do we do? You know, how do we start doing this uh, activity? So how do we help our organizations manage reputational risk? So we have a few, we have some ideas that we're going to walk through now. Uh, we're going to ask some more questions as sort of ways of, of, you know, discussing this. So, you know, maybe one thing that we should start with is, you know, what does... Uh, an organizational unit that is at risk look like? Like, what is it exactly that we're looking to fix or to mitigate here? Yeah, how do we know where to direct our resources? Right. You know, that's the big question is, you know, we have finite resources. No matter how, re how many resources we are able to secure, we're still going to have a finite amount of them. Uh, so we need some criteria to decide where where to put those resources. And that's what we want to walk you through this afternoon is, you know, what are the features of an at-risk organizational unit? And the reason we want to do this is because measuring risk and thinking about relative risk in our organizations is what's going to allow us to effectively deploy those resources. That's right. And if you don't have an idea about, you know, what, uh, where the most most risk lies within your organization, then you can't even start to have that discussion about how best to deploy resources to mitigate it. Yeah, so as a starting point, uh, something that we suggest that you do is uh, consider conducting a reputational risk profile for your organization. Uh, you know, look at your strategic plan, look at your planned work documents in your organization, and think about you know what work uh, in those documents 
what kind of missionaries, what kind of programs present the greatest risk uh, for you know, criticism to the agency, actual ethics problems, conflicts of interest, all of the things that we seek to manage every day. Uh, so what we want to do now is give you some tools uh, to think about what the features are of an at-risk organization, help you distinguish between those blocks on the org chart, and decide who's most in need. So what kind of things are we looking for, Ryan, when we're trying to find uh, risk to the reputation or risk of conflicts of interest in an organization? Well, that, so there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a number of them. Um, Particularly, we want to look at uh, areas where work is going to be affecting outside entities uh, because... And that's something we're familiar with. Right. Uh, that's something that's not new to us. Anyone who's done a 450 filer designation knows that you know, this is one of the first questions, mm -hmm. right? You know, do you investigate? Do you procure? Um, all of those are activities uh, that, that affect outside entities. So that's, that's a good starting point, and I think that's a place that's very familiar for folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, other other places where we find risk is uh, places where there's infrequent oversight, uh, where you know the, the the sunlight does not shine very often. Yeah, and you know it's uh, it's easy for people to you know follow the rules and think hard about the integrity of their programs and take steps to ensure that when lots of people are watching, when you're in the spotlight, when you're under the microscope, uh, it, it's very easy to keep that at the front of your mind. Uh, you know, I won't mention anyone in particular, but I think if you think back over the last you know three, five, ten years about where the government's run into problems uh, with ethical failure and you think about uh, you know, how those organizational units related to headquarters uh, in general, you find that sometimes distance from the inspector general, distance from the DC press, distance from good governance groups that provide oversight uh, can create an environment where misconduct is, is more likely uh, because it's just not at the forefront of our, of our thoughts every day. That's right. Uh, it, you, so you just mentioned geographic isolation, but also an isolation from, uh, you know, preventative guidance or infrastructure or anything like that. So, but, you know, the further away that you get from, from the microscope or from... From the ethics yeah, office. from the ethics office. Uh, from the inspector from general's office. Uh, yeah, it, it's easy to let these things, uh, you know, sort of slip off the radar. Mm -hmm. And it, as ethics officials, we can, uh, we can intervene to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and and the the what the other one, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. Uh, but the other one uh, that, that that's pretty common is when uh, you have people who are working in a uh, punitive decision-making environment, where you know any decision they make is going to be criticized by their supervisor or you know their manager. You know that kind of uh, that kind of environment puts people uh, in a bad spot in the in the sense that it sets them up. Uh, to fail ethically. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, there, are, there are good examples of this. Uh, it's human beings, we don't like to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, we fear losing much more than we fear not winning, uh, which is kind of a strange, uh, a, a, a strange uh, characteristic of the way that we think and make decisions. But when you put someone in a position where they have something to lose, uh, and especially if you constrain them temporally, you don't give them much time to think about it, uh, there's there's a tendency to get the job done at any cost. You know, just go win. Uh, I'm not worried about the rules. I just want to make sure we win this one. And we've included for you a um, a study that we referenced in previous broadcasts. But if you haven't taken a look at it, we would encourage you to do so. Uh, that deals with the perils of loss framing. Mm -hmm. And when we say loss framing, what we mean is uh, the difficulties that happen when human beings are put in in a scenario where they apparently have something to lose. And what the, uh, what the, the authors of this study did, uh, they conducted a negotiation. Uh, uh, they set up a negotiation, sort of a fake negotiation for participants in the study, and they created some frames. Uh, and the first frame they used, they called the win frame. Uh, so what they told employ uh, the, the participants in the study is that uh, you're gonna go into a negotiation. Here's the information that you have to, to conduct the negotiation. Please don't lie or misrepresent any of it. Have uh, an honest negotiation. And you have a 25% chance of succeeding uh, and winning at the negotiation. Mm -hmm. And then they observe what happened. And what happened, Ryan? Well, so the, the, the folks who were told that they have a 25% chance of winning and a 75% chance of losing uh, generally didn't cheat. That's right. They didn't lie or misrepresent during the negotiation. So the people who thought they were going in to perhaps gain something uh, mm -hmm. were not inclined uh, to, to break the directive, not to misrepresent the information, not to basically commit fraud. 
Now, the other thing that the study did uh, that was curious is they had some people, uh, they had another group where they said, you already have the contract. You've won the negotiation, you won it last time, and right. it's time to renegotiate, right? Right, and so when you renegotiate it, uh, you have, uh, you know, a 50, what was it, a 50% think, chance of losing it? I think a 75, I think they were mathematically identical, ah, a 75% okay. chance of losing it. Right. Right, so you're, you're the incumbent on the contract, you're going into the negotiation, and you're probably gonna lose. Right, so, so what happened then, Patrick? Uh, a, a significant, uh, uh, significantly more people uh, misrepresented the uh, the material they were given to conduct the negotiation. They, so they, they, they cheated. Bro they broke the rule. Yes, yeah. they, they cheated. Not a huge number, but a fairly sizable number. A significant number of people, when put in that basic loss frame, were more likely to break the rules. That's right. So, so that's that's what we mean by loss framing. Is it's just how how do we how do we frame the losing? Is it right. something that that you're probably not going to get, or is it something you already have that you might might then be taken away? Yeah. So, and you know, the way that we might see this come up in organizations is how is, how are employees rewarded or disciplined? Uh, you know, do you have an office culture that rewards good work, or do you have an office culture that punishes uh, work that's you know maybe too slow or not up to spec, uh, or do you do a mix of both? But the really interesting thing was the third iteration in that in that uh, study, mm -hmm. where they took the loss frame. So they, they put people in the same situation. They said, you know, you're the incumbent on the contract. You're renegotiating you're and renegotiating. you have a seventy-five percent chance of losing. You're probably going to lose. And rather than giving them a lot of time to think about their strategy, they gave them a tiny amount of time. They really put them under temporal constraints. Yeah, was it said, like 10, 15 minutes? It was a very short period of time to get familiar with the material mm -hmm. and then go make some decisions about how they're going to run the investigation, or so, the negotiation, rather. Yeah, so what happened then? Uh, an enormously uh, greater number of people engaged in cheating. They broke the rule. So people who were put in loss frames and uh, temporal circumstances that sort of suggest desperation were, uh, were significantly more likely to, uh, to engage in misconduct, to, to cheat in the, in the experiment. So, yeah, so this is an area where this isn't about ethics compliance. This is about you know, management structures and controls and how we, how we treat and reward employees uh, that can be really helpful. It's an area as ethics officials that you can consult. So let's make sure as an organization, to the extent possible, we're not putting people in situations that make them more likely to cheat. That's right, because, I mean, you can't... Uh you know, you can't control a bad actor. If someone's going to do something bad, they're going to do that, right? But you can control the situations in which, you know, good people might make bad decisions. Right. We don't want to put people in, in situations that are likely to make, uh, to cause them to, to, to make bad decisions. We want to be thoughtful uh, when we're talking to supervisors, and this is something you can use in your supervisor training, that when a supervisor says, I don't care, just get it done, what employees hear? Uh, I think that's a good place to have a conversation, you know, find out, you know, is that something people say sometimes? And do they realize how that's understood sometimes by employees? And, uh, you know, to suggest caution when you when you do things like that. Yeah. So let's also talk about, so we're kind of, we're kind of building sort of an outline uh, of what we're talking about. When do organizations face the most risk, Patrick? Yeah, because it's not static over time. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of getting at this. When you uh, put someone under time constraints or tight deadlines, and put them in a loss frame, you you increase the possibility uh, of, of organizational failure, of uh, you increase reputational risk. And not only that, people don't like change also very that. much. Yes. Uh, you know, you it's have stressful. Changes. Yeah, it's stressful. Reorganizations, changes in leaderships, reduction in force, uh, you know, stressful changes uh, also uh, lead people into situations where they could make bad decisions. Yeah, and it, even increase in workload, and this is something we're familiar with. Uh, you know, we've been doing more with less for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And as you, as those, uh, as those constraints tighten, uh, you know, it becomes easier and easier to decide that, you know, well, that ethics stuff is, 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 is too time consuming. And it requires greater effort by us as, as the ethics officials to one, recognize that that's happening, and then to, uh, to create timely interventions to make sure that people realize they're at risk. Because in many cases, just measuring and acknowledging that there's risk can be extremely helpful in helping organizations mitigate it. So let's talk. How can we use the How can we use the information that we've got to manage risk? It's a good question. Uh, I, I think a good place to start uh, is to do the assessment, mm -hmm. and then use that assessment to help us deploy resources. Yeah. So. We've got a few different uh, kinds of uh, kinds of assessments and a few different resources that we can consult when we talk about this sort of thing. And one of them is uh, GAO's Green Book. 
uh, for setting up internal controls. Uh, while it's, it, it is, uh, I guess you could call it a kind of risk management. Yes. Um, it's not one that, that, there are certain things that the Green Book doesn't consider, but there are other things that it does that may not necessarily fit into uh, a risk management profile. But if you're, if you're looking for a way of thinking about it, the Green Book is a good place to start, and I recommend that you read it. Uh, yeah, and that's going to be something that others in your organization are familiar with, and it might provide you a, a baseline vocabulary that is familiar to others in your organization that help to manage risk and implement our internal controls. And to the extent you can see the ethics program as part of those internal controls and risk mitigation strategies, uh, you can be better positioned to, uh, to, to get resources for your program and be effective. That's right. Uh, so, so. so after we've done our assessment, one of the things that we need to that we need to talk about is then we have to prioritize. We have to figure out what risks are the ones that are most important for us to deploy our resources to because it, it, it would be, be a very lucky ethics program that had enough resources to to deal with all of its risk at once. But yeah, and I, I think you know this is sensible because what we're going to want to accomplish is uh, to create internal controls and risk mitigation strategies that are um, proportional to the risks that our organizations face. Uh, you, know, you can't reduce risk to zero, and even if you could, you probably wouldn't want to. Uh, but it is important to think about where we face risk and what kinds of risks. And sometimes they're quite disparate, and it can be difficult to compare one to the other. So we'd like to share with you a model, and uh, we didn't invent this. I think this dates back at least as far as uh, the, the rather famous uh, tort claim case. Uh, oh, Learned Hand. Yes, Judge Learned Hand. In, yeah. uh, I think it was a maritime law case. Uh, first proposed this as, as uh, a way to measure duty of care. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also used in, in you know, different forms in a lot of the literature that we've, we've linked to. So if you don't like our particular calibration of the, of the, risk, uh, the risk comparison feature, there are lots of models out there that can help you sort of get a rough idea of what, what kind of situation your agency is facing. So let's take a look at that. So here's the first one uh, that, that, that we're looking at. And the way that we've measured it is uh, we're, we're just talking about the magnitude of the effect uh, if, if a particular thing happened versus the probability of its occurrence. And we've kind of graphed this out. And it's, it may be a little bit confusing uh, when you're looking at it initially. But uh, just to give you an idea, you know, we have a picture of some flames on the one side of it uh, to sign you know, signify like your house burning down. Like that is a, a the magnitude of that is catastrophic, quite literally. So we have, let me, let me make sure I understand, Ryan. So we have two risks here that mm -hmm. are presented. Uh, so one is the risk of a fire in your home, mm -hmm. and that's represented by the vertical bar. And that's we, right. We, we can see there that uh, the effect of your house catching fire is, is catastrophic. Uh, if your house were to burn down, that could be a terrible situation. That's right. But one thing that I do want to point out is is that it, the probability of that occurring is very, very low. It, yes, it's quite small. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a, another risk graphed here uh, indicated by the blue bar. Right. And on the blue bar, we've got a picture of an ant. We've got a picture of a rat and a picture of uh, a cockroach, common household pests. Common household pests. So there's a risk of, of, of infestation by household pests in, in any dwelling. Right. Uh, and the probability of that occurring sometime uh, in, in your lifetime in which you live in a dwelling is pretty high. Very high. Right. You know, I, I don't know. It, it seems like every fall, you know, if the weather starts to turn, like you know, at least a mouse or two tends to make its way into my house, no matter mm -hmm. what I do. Yep. Um, so we have two risks here. And well, how do we compare these, Ryan? How does this how does this graph help us make a comparison? Well, so so the way that we make this comparison is by looking again at the magnitude of the effect. Your house catching fire would be catastrophic, whereas you know the having ants in your house over the summer uh, is going to be inconvenient. That's not going to be catastrophic. And, and then we look at how likely these things are going to occur as a way of uh, of uh, measuring which ones we're going to want to. Uh, what measures we would like to take to prevent them. So we basically look at the area covered uh, in each of the bars. Right. Uh, and you can see the area in these two bars is roughly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we're prioritizing these things, uh, we should take some action and we should make sure that that action is proportional. And I think if you think about your own home, uh, you probably take uh, preventative measures on, on a similar level for these two kinds of risk. You, know, you probably have fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, uh, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, insurance, uh, those kinds of, kinds of things to mitigate a potential fire. Mm -hmm. uh, and you probably keep on hand um, some mouse traps, some, mouse and traps, some, some, some bug spray. Uh, you might have a contract with, uh, you know, with an exterminator 
uh, those kinds of things. But you know, proportionally, those are, are while they're very different risks uh, in their profile, uh, we take similar similar degrees of action to prevent them because uh, of their similarity. So let's see what this looks like uh, when we bring it into the ethics program. So for this one, we've got, uh, we, again, we have two bars. Uh, the first one, the red bar, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, a conflict of interest, someone committing fraud. We have a, a gentleman robbing a safe right there. Yeah, really bad uh, ethics stuff. You know, true misconduct, criminal activity by our employees. Right. Uh, and that's something that we hope doesn't happen frequently in, in your organization. We don't see it very frequently. But the effect of that can be catastrophic on an organization. It can be very bad for the reputation of organization. It can be very expensive to clean up. That's right, because when, when you do have something like that happen, what are we looking at? We're looking at you know, a FOIA request for everything the agency has done for as long as that person has been there. And just could, preparing that will, will take up a significant amount of you time. You have bid protests, you have IG investigations, you might have a criminal investigation. Yeah, people called down to the Hill on a regular basis. You could have employees, uh, you know, needing to testify. Uh, you know, you could have someone come in and do a program ad hoc audit to make sure that this is just a bad actor and not... Uh, not a situation where you have some systemic failure. Right. If you have systemic failure, it can get even worse. So, you know, these are circumstances that, while not enormously likely, can be very bad for our organizations. And, and what's, the, what's the thing that we're not doing when we're, taking, we're, we're having to clean up that mess? All the other important work of our agencies. Right. We're not doing our mission then. And we can see this here compared to some of the, uh, maybe the, the smaller ethical missteps, uh, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day things. What we have here, we have someone maybe takes a meal that they shouldn't have accepted, uh, or someone's pilfering office supplies. Or they're uh, using the copy machine to make flyers for their bake sale. Right, and while those are prohibited under the rules, the consequences for our organization are, you know, it's maybe disruptive or inconvenient to the organization. We want to take steps to prevent it. Um, but because it's much more likely to happen uh, than someone, you know, engaged in willful misconduct, criminal activity, we similarly, uh, we take uh, similar steps to address them. Uh, so these are topics that we cover in our annual ethics training. These are reminders that we send out uh, for both of these topics. Uh, but, you know, in the case of conflicts of interest, we, uh, we l add to that uh, our financial disclosure review. You know, that's a kind of risk mitigation. Annual training. Annual training, our advice and counsel program, mm -hmm. supervisor training, briefings of people who are at greatest risk. So we can use a model like this to see where our risks are, compare them to one another, um, and, and then, you know, make strategic decisions about where to use our training resources, you know, uh, you know, how frequently we should engage with different work units, you know, should we be attending staff meetings? Uh, should we be going to uh, the project launch meeting of a particular new initiative to discuss risks? Yeah, and the, I think the proportionality right there is, is an important point that I'd like, I'd like to emphasize there for a minute, because if you have someone who, you know, is pilfering office supplies, uh, you're not going to want to appoint someone to follow that person around to make sure that they don't take a pencil right. accidentally. Um, but what you can do is put up a sign next to the office supplies that says, don't take the office supplies unless you need them. Yeah, no, so I think, you know, we want to think about, you know, what's proportional. And by engaging in this activity, we can look at all the risks our organizations face, compare them to one another, and decide what level of, uh, of prevention that the organization is comfortable with. Yeah. So let's talk about some strategies. What are some things that we can do uh, to manage risk? So we've been talking about assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and assessments are things that you need to do more than once. Right. You have to do, the, you, you have to do them, uh, you know. I, uh, periodically. Periodically, yeah. Uh, whatever that period is, you, you know, you can determine what is best for your agency. And what I'd encourage folks to do is, um, you know, in the performance management at your agencies, uh, periodic assessments are being made of all the work that your agencies are doing. Uh, and periodic planning uh, is taking place to decide what's going to take place over the next year, or six months, or quarter. Uh, find out what that schedule is and see if you can align the ethics program's risk assessment with the management assessment program at your agency so that you can be prepared to participate in those conversations and raise these issues and look at the work as it's being planned. Right. You want to have a 50,000-foot view of all of the work that your agency is doing so that, so that you can uh, more appropriately... Uh, help plan for mitigating ethical risk as that work is being planned. And you know, hopefully include yourself yeah, in, in the planning of that work. And in order to do that, you're going to have to leverage partnerships. This mm -hmm. is not something that the ethics office can do in isolation. Uh, you know, to help others with the work and to help others protect the integrity of their programs, we're going to have to learn about their programs. We're going to have to know what they're planning. 
Uh, so you're going to need to build partnerships. And uh, we hope that this framework gives you an idea of how you can start those conversations. Uh, you can say, you know, it's really important for our organization to think about these risks. And, you know, I'd like to help you determine what level of risk we're comfortable with as an organization. Yeah, and, and that's going to allow you to strategically deploy your resources. Uh, you're going to be able to, once you know what's going on, once you have some overall awareness of what your agency is planning to do uh, through your periodic assessment and through leveraging partnerships, you're then able to, uh, you know, sort of flow your resources to the most appropriate areas or where it is needed the most. Yeah, so, you know, you could probably think about one or two high-profile activities that your agency uh, is going to engage in in the next year. And think about what level of resourcing would be appropriate to uh, to, to manage those programs. Uh, and finally, we want to talk about um, we want to talk about uh, st uh, timely interventions and training. This one's really interesting. Because yeah, what we found uh, in our research is that uh, the timeliness of interventions is, in many cases, more important than the content or duration. That's right. Uh, so what what some folks have found is that a, a simple reminder at the right time has uh, as much effect as, you know, a, a days-long class that uh, you know, took place months ago. Uh, so, you know, people are, are, you know, we're human, we go through time, uh, things that we heard before, uh, you know, fade in our memories. Uh, so those timely reminders are really important. So we want our interventions to be timely and uh, synchronized with the, the ethics needs of our organization. So we want to do things like outreach to managers. Uh, but not just outreach to managers generally, outreach to managers at the right time of year. So maybe, could you give me an example of like, what, what are you talking about with timely outreach to managers? Give, give me a concrete example. So um, a, a time that comes up, I think, for most agencies is you get towards the end of the fiscal year, uh, you have an increase in procurement activity. Oh, and, yeah. And you know that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that when work affects outside entities, uh, you know, like procurements, uh, you have an increased risk uh, for reputational harm uh, mm -hmm. or other ethical failures. To acknowledge that risk and to plan, uh, you know, it could be a, a simple training, it could be a briefing at a staff meeting, it could be an email reminder, uh, at the time of greatest need, uh, can go a long way towards reminding people of their obligations uh, and getting them to act upon that. So maybe, so, so let's say that your agency is working on a brand new contract. Like yes. Maybe not even at the end of the year, just a brand new contract. Oftentimes at the beginning of the year, these things come up. You have, yeah. you have teams uh, assembled to begin working on, you know, maybe a new procurement or a new initiative or a new regulation. Uh, something we could do there, and this is something I used to do um, when, when I was in an agency, would be to sit down, attend the first meeting of, of, the, of the project team, and just listen, you know, find out what they're planning to do, how they intend to proceed, and provide any support or guidance or offers of support uh, as they proceed through the project, point out areas that are, that are likely to be problematic for them. You know, sort of do some of that risk spotting for them. You know, we want our employees to be able to spot risks, but sometimes they can be uh, you know, pretty well hidden and we want to make sure that, uh, you know, to the extent uh, our presence is necessary, that we can be present and help people make those decisions. Well, and one of the other nice nice little side effects of that is that then they know who you are. They know what you look like, and they know where to find you. That's right. You know, I always, always ask people to think about when they conduct initial ethics orientation or annual briefings in person. And what always happens after those briefings? You know, I, I can think of one thing that always happens to me when I give an employee briefing. After that happens, you get all kinds of questions. You get lots of questions. And I always wonder what happens to those questions the rest of the year. Yeah, me too. Uh, so creating opportunities and reminders uh, that can provoke those questions can go a long way to helping your agency uh, manage these risks. So, uh, and then we've also, we, we've also got a, uh, uh, an, a, this idea of uh, gaming the response strategy. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is another way, oftentimes when we talk about ethics, it's difficult to see the value in the program, right? How do you measure violations that don't occur or problems that don't happen? You know, how do you value that? Uh, and it's very difficult, and organizations tend to undervalue it until something happens, and then they realize it's extremely valuable and the resources pile up and uh, mm -hmm. ethics becomes a, a, you know, a resource-intensive part of the program. So what we'd like you to suggest as a possibility, you know, to help you get your own mind around that is to think about it. Imagine that something bad happened to your agency. You found out an employee somewhere was uh, engaged in criminal misconduct, or there was a significant problem with a piece of work or the integrity of the process that uh, went into it. And think about how your organization would respond. Uh, imagine that you were answering questions from the inspector general or from GAO or from uh, your oversight committee on the Hill. You know, would you have a compelling story to tell? Could you 
adequately articulate the kinds of work that your agency has done to manage those risks? And would you feel confident that uh, that, that would be well accepted? Uh, you know, could you sit there and say, you know, we did everything that we reasonably could, or we did what's reasonable to manage those risks. We had seen the risk. Uh, we're sorry it came to fruition, but these are the steps we took to try and mitigate it. Um, so that, that can be a, a helpful exercise when thinking about the adequacy of, of the resources and the interventions. Yeah, and, and one of the things, there, there's, also, there's all kinds of resources uh, online that you can find about, you know, how to, uh, how, how to set up this sort of ethics war game, if you will. Um, but but it's it's useful to just think about it, even if you don't engage in the actual gaming aspect of it. Right. Uh, yeah. And and I think there are some really concrete things that happen when mm -hmm. there's misconduct. You know, what are you going to want to be able to produce? If it's an individual employee engaged in misconduct, can you prove that they received training? Do you have their financial disclosure report? Uh, do you have quick access to any advice that you may have given them? Mm -hmm. uh, does the advice contain sufficient uh, detail and uh, and, and and circumstances to make sure that either they gave you all the facts or they withheld facts from you. Uh, you know, looking at that material, would you feel comfortable that, uh, that your program is performing effectively? Yeah. So let's maybe, let's zoom back in a little bit since you just mentioned, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a single employee engaging in misconduct, you know, is it possible to, to identify at risk employees? So yeah. this is kind of, this is sort of a, a, a different uh, a different tack, and we kind of include this for completeness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those people who are engaged in you know fraud prevention and detection uh, use uh, use these kinds of tools. Uh, this is also something that you can help sensitize your uh, your supervisors to, as they're going to be the people who can see you know when an employee is having trouble or is maybe at, uh, at risk. But we want to spend a little bit of time talking about these things, just so that uh, when you can have some familiarity with uh, the, the way that fraud prevention professionals look at this stuff. Also, it's kind of interesting and can help you with your supervisor training. Well, and not only that, one of the things that I would like to I would like to point out is we're not talking about the employee him or herself per se. We're not talking about that employee's integrity. What we're talking about is the situation. The situation the in which employee the employee find, would yeah. find him or herself. Yeah, and it's the situations. It's the it's the the outside the, the variables outside of the employee that cause uh, the, the potential for fraud to occur. And actually, and so, as, as we go through this, I'd like us to maybe uh, think about a, a well-worn example uh, mm -hmm. that I think we have a common narrative about, but then I think as we talk about these concepts, you can look at it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Darlene Druyan. Uh, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version if you're not. Uh, she used to be the head of procurement at the Air Force. Uh, she was known as the Dragon Lady because she was an excellent negotiator. She always got the government uh, the best price that they could possibly get. Uh, she was known to be uh, a very independent worker. Uh, she liked to conduct her negotiations herself. She didn't like to involve a lot of others. And she was extremely effective, very knowledgeable about the procurement process, very good at getting maximum value for the Air Force. Until a few months before her retirement, yeah, uh, where she basically conspired with Boeing uh, to give them a good deal on a contract in exchange for finding um, finding employment for her after she left the government service, as well as... Uh, for a child of hers who was having some financial difficulty. And usually we say, well, Darlene Drian knew the ethics rules better than any of us. She clearly knew what she was doing was wrong. This is clearly just a bad actor. Um, but I think if we, if, as we look at these next, uh, these next set of uh, criteria, you might be able to, uh, to think a little bit differently about it. Right, and so that's why we put this picture of GAO's fraud triangle up, because with, uh, with, with uh, Darlene Drian, she definitely had the opportunity. Yeah, she, uh, she worked basically without oversight, very independently. She controlled the purse strings, uh, mm -hmm. basically with no one else's sign off. So there's all, lots of opportunity. Right. And and she also had some incentives. She was getting ready to retire mm -hmm. uh, from, from federal service. So she was, you know, looking beyond to what she was going to be doing after that. She had some uh, financial stresses. Yep. She had some financial stress, stresses, not only on herself, but also on one of her children and uh, her husband. Yes. Um, so there, 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 there were uh, plenty, of plenty of opportunities and lots of incentive, and uh, she was able to rationalize. And in, uh, in, in fact, in the course of the investigation, she described her activity as the cherry on top of a career of excellent public service. Right. That uh, somehow all of the work that she had done before entitled her to this benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems that that's the way that she, she rationalized uh, the, the, the fraudulent activity. Right. Uh, so we're going to talk about some more strategies. Uh, we talked about enlisting managers, and as you're planning your training for the next year, think about your management training. You know, these are the people who are going to see the problems. They're going to see the risks first, um, and you can help them help you. Right, because be, because if you can if you can get them on board. 
to help do some of the some of the timely interventions that we were talking about um, and to proactively be identifying the risk of uh, reputational risk and risk of ethical failure within their employees um, then you know they, 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 they will be more likely a to ask you for help with that but you'll also be able to rely on them to sort of be your eyes on the ground uh, you don't have to be in every single meeting of every single business unit or anything like that and I want to make a, a, a an important point here uh, we often focus a lot in our training on the rules do you, know, do you know what the rules require you do know what's against the rules and what's not against the rules and the question I like to ask when I'm dealing with managers is imagine you observed an employee if you're say it's a very high performing employee engaged in some sort of almost de minimis ethical laps, uh, you know, maybe misappropriating the copy machine for, for private purposes, you know, printing out a bunch of flyers. And if you ask them, do you know that that's against the rules? Most of your managers say, yeah, we know that's against the rules. The thing to ask them is, what would you do in that situation? And then you have an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that there's a reluctance, you know, to call in, uh, you know, the, the, the inspector general to conduct an investigation. Don't think anyone thinks that's a great idea. But to talk about the spectrum of interventions that are available. Uh, you know, to make it known that as an ethics official, you're willing to come in and clarify the policy, uh, that you're willing to conduct one-on-one -on -one training with employees who seem to be unclear on, you know, the rules and the policies. Uh, you know, to give them sort of that broad spectrum uh, and understand that there is a willingness in the ethics office to conduct those activities makes it more likely that they'll ask you for help in the right circumstances. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the and they'll be more likely to actually do the intervention then. That's right. Uh, because you're if you're if you're going to be a resource for them uh, to help ensure that everything is is done uh, done the correct way then they're going to be more likely to use you. Right. And that's going to help you allocate your educational resources strategically. If you have supervisors coming to you saying we have this new piece of work, we want to make sure that we keep everything uh, you know, within the rules. We want to make sure to think about all the risks to the organization and the integrity of the program. And we want you to come up with a plan with us uh, to help manage that. Uh, that's a good allocation of your resources. Also allows you to provide timely support with those resources mm -hmm. so that you're delivering the training or you're delivering the counseling at the moment it is needed, uh, not delivering it months or years before and hoping that everything's going to be okay. Yeah. So we're just going to go over a, a, a couple more resources here briefly. Um, so I've got a picture of the uh, the Orange Book, which is the risk management strategy for uh, the United Kingdom. So enterprise risk management, not just uh, a U.S. phenomenon. Right. It is. It is all over the world. You can find enterprise risk management plans for. I know that the UK has got uh, has got one for the whole government. Uh, the uh, Australian government has uh, a requirement that some agencies have them, so you can find those. Uh, but I mean, for the most part, the language is consistent. Uh, yeah, the, the conceptually, they're those. very similar, but uh, they 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 provide helpful models for uh, risk assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Orange Book has, has a nice chart that you can use uh, for plotting your risk on an axis and measuring them against each other. Uh, so if you don't like our charts, uh, you know, this is another resource where you might find some that you prefer. Yeah. And we did mention that we consulted a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of works, a lot of research when we uh, put this presentation together. And I would encourage everyone to you know take a few minutes and at least you know flip through these things, uh, you know bookmark them, because they could be helpful uh, next time you're called in to talk to your your agency's budget management and performance folks. One to be familiar with some of the things they're likely familiar with, uh, but also to see places in those documents that provide you opportunities to uh, support the agency and participate in those activities. Right, and and like like we said at the beginning, this is this is something that's going to become more and more important as time goes on in government, and it's. Uh, particularly the orange book and, and the green book, it's good to become conversant in these ideas. Yeah, and uh, the psychology of fraud article uh, here, why good people do bad things, is one really fascinating, uh, and two a, a relatively entertaining read. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, I found it to be very illuminating uh, as an ethics official, and uh, I was also I was also entertained, and that's, that's <laughs> a rare thing. Yeah. Uh, so in conclusion, we hope that this provides you a framework to start thinking about risk in your organizations, to start thinking about ways that you can support the mission and how you can change the conversation with your agency leadership uh, so that you're asking them, you know, how is it that the ethics office can support uh, the, the management of reputational risk? How can we ensure the integrity of our programs and operations? Uh, so hopefully we've provided you some tools to begin that conversation, some tools to begin conducting that, uh, that risk assessment. 
uh, and then maybe we can uh, we can direct our compliance resources in ways that most effectively protect the entire organization. In ways that most effectively proactively protect the, the organization. Absolutely. Uh, so that concludes our presentation on enterprise risk management. And before we go, we do have some, uh, some rather sad news for us, uh, happy news for Ryan. Uh, this will likely be Ryan's last broadcast with, here, uh, with us here at, uh, at OGE's Institute for Ethics and Government. Uh, because you're going on. Where are you going, Ryan? Uh, I'm going to the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, well, it's been a great pleasure setting up the, uh, the Institute for Ethics and Government's uh, YouTube and Google Plus accounts and delivering these broadcasts with you. Uh, we all wish you the best of luck uh, in your new role at the Department of Agriculture. We do hope you'll come back and share some of your lessons learned and expertise. I, I, I look forward to doing, it, to doing that. Uh, uh, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to come back, uh, uh, come back as often as, as you'll have me. So uh, thank you very much. And I'd also like to take a moment to say thanks to all of you out there uh, for all of your uh, suggestions and uh, uh, your uh, kind, if sometimes candid, evaluations of uh, how, we, how we do these things. It's been very helpful. And uh, yeah, we yeah. appreciate that. I would also like to wish everyone a happy holidays and uh, you know, best wishes for the new year. And we'll see you in the new year with uh, Lee Francis and Seth Jaffe. We'll be talking about um, some part related H. Related to official duties. Related to official duties. For 807. 807. Uh, so we'll see you then. Uh, happy holidays and uh, happy new year. All right. I'm Ryan Segrist signing off. Maybe I'll see you sometime later. <laughs>